So unfortunately, Tyler Roche could not be present, but I, Tyler Ross, uh, <laughs> will be speaking on his behalf. We're going to talk today about uh, controlling the motion of DNA gliders, and to start with, uh, motivation is always nice. Um, so we're interested in eventually developing um, smart materials and making miniaturized portable devices, and so we're inspired by nature. Uh, so nature is very good at this, can uh, create materials that uh, rapidly change properties, uh, as shown here uh, through the uh, chromatophore. Uh, and you know, we want to miniaturize uh, devices such as cell sorters so that you can uh, you know, put them in your pocket, take them wherever you want. Uh, and, and to uh, achieve these things, we need the capability to control motion at the micrometer length scale. Uh, so I can talk about uh, what we're currently able to do. Uh, and again, we're inspired by uh, nature, which uses uh, molecular motors to uh, achieve this type of motion. Uh, so in my PhD, I took uh, these molecular motors as uh, the cartoon here, and I made it so that, uh, so, okay, sorry. So these motor proteins, they consume a kind of chemical energy, ATP, and they walk along these rigid microtubules. Uh, microtubules are helical, so they have a minus end and a plus end, and these specific motors we're thinking about, they move towards the plus end. So I engineered them so that they cluster together when you shine light on them, and uh, this is a reversible process. And so we can start with this mixture of just this purified solution of these proteins. We shine light as indicated in yellow, and those motors in the lit region come together, pull the microtubule plus ends together, and form an aster. Outside of that region, uh, everything remains disordered. And so you can see in this nice little illustration here of kind of what that, uh, we envision what that looks like. And so in doing that, you know, we can shine light to uh, create asters, uh, move them around. Uh, we can link them together, have them interact over uh, many micrometers, and we can generate dynamic fluid flows. Um, so that's really cool. But if we want to make uh, smart materials, we want to have many moving objects. Uh, so again, we're, we like our molecular motors, so uh, we can take this system that people have played around with quite a lot, uh, called the gliding assay. So you glue these motor proteins onto a glass surface, and uh, now you have these microtubules that are uh, flowing along them. And so you can see they move quite rapidly along the surface in this gliding assay. Um, so this is really cool. The issue is that microtubules are not really programmable in, in any way. They're, uh, evolutionarily conserve, you try to mess around with them, uh, bad stuff happens. But uh, something that is very programmable, uh, as many of you know, is DNA. Uh, so you can you know, control its shape, uh, is capable of uh, doing some sorts of computation, and you can switch it with light through azobenzene. Um, so the question is, can we build programmable DNA gliders, which Matteo will now talk about? So um, we started from this res recent development where they take a motor that would normally walk on microtubules, and you can see it has a head that performs the sort of kick and a foot that binds to the microtubule, and then you can just remove the foot and use a new foot that now binds to DNA, and that seems to work pretty well. And you can see here, this is the gliding assay that Tyler was talking about. So you glue these motors on a glass slide uh, by their head and their feet are like dangling in space and pushing these nanotubes around. So these nanotubes are made out of DNA and they have these binding sequences all along their length and circumference. So now you just get to see um, nanotubes made out of DNA that are gliding and it looks a lot like what you saw before when the microtubules were gliding. So that is also kind of the limitation of this system because nanotubes, um, just like microtubules, are not very programmable. And you can see with microtubules, most of what we can do is stick them together and try to get that sort of aster. We can sort of make um, aggregates of DNA nanotubes or seed them, but they're not programmable. They just, they're very good at growing very long tubes, but not more than that. So uh, our question was, if we want to build DNA nanorobots, how can we make these uh, a little smarter? So um, the first thing we looked at is the tile that I'm showing here, which was designed by Greg. Um, and you see it has 
different helices orientations, uh, horizontal and vertical. So you could imagine if you put these um, binding sites for the motors on the different orientations, you could get different kind of motion in different directions. And um, you see how the tiles design. So all the black dots are sites that we, are, that we have modified. Uh, the gray dots are sites that we can modify. And then on the edges, you see those sort of, uh, it looks like a jigsaw puzzle piece because these tiles have edges that can stick together and build uh, larger arrays. So um, we thought, so if we modify the horizontal helices, now we can maybe get a ribbon that moves uh, gliding along its axis. If we modify the opposite sides, now it can maybe move um, perpendicular to its axis. And then if we make something a little more complex, uh, using more type of tiles, we could get cross-shaped structures that glide uh, and just translate or spin, or even get uh, pulled together or ripped apart, just depending on the orientation of these uh, sites. So uh, the other option that we have, of course, is what the system that William was uh, showing before. And here we can build very large unbounded arrays uh, of uh, DNA structures or even very large finite structures. Uh, I forgot to mention, we want them to be big because we, ideally we want to see them under a light microscope. So they need to be above the limit of diffraction. Otherwise, we're just looking at diffraction limited spots moving around and we can't say much about them. But um, assuming we can get this to work, uh, we will have DNA nanorobots that can move around on a surface, that can do so very fast. Um, we're talking about 100 of nanometers per second, whereas DNA walkers are usually 10 to 100 times slower, at least. Um, but what we would like to have is also have control over these structures. DNA nanotechnology gives us a lot of options of things that we can do. We can take, release payload, um, DNA strand displacement, all sort of things. But we would also like to control the direction of the motion. And so um, we looked at azobenzene. Uh, it's a switch molecule, photoswitchable uh, molecule that has two states. You can see uh, cis state and trans state. And by shining the right uh, wavelength of light on it, you can switch between the two states. Both of them are very stable, at least in the, the range of hours, and are very fast in switching time. And what's interesting is that in the cis state, uh, if you um, modify DNA with azobenzene, two complementary DNA strands can't bind together. But if you switch it to the trans state, now the two strands can bind together again. So it kind of acts as an on-off switch for um, DNA hybridization. So um, imagine that our DNA origami on the left looks like this once you zoom in on the motor binding sequence. And you have strand, uh, you can see where you see crosses, those points are points of attachment of these strands to the DNA origami. So um, you can see strand A that has the motor binding site is uh, bound to C because the azobenzene is in the um, trans state, so uh, it can let the two strands bind. But uh, if we shine light on it, now um, the azobenzene will switch to the cis state. Um, the two strands can't bind anymore, and most likely strand A will end up bound to strand B. So now you switch the orientation of um, the motor binding sites, and the structure should move uh, in a different direction. And if we make the binding between A and B quite uh, reversible, then you can imagine that as long as we're in the on state, uh, even if A uh, gets released from B, it will still end up falling back onto B. But if we switch the light on again, and now it can hybridize to C, it will uh, likely end up bound to C. So this is a semi-stable switch that could um, direct the motion of the structure, and you can imagine it's moving vertically. You shine light on it, starts to move horizontally, and then you uh, shine the opposite uh, wavelength on it, and it moves again. So ideally, maybe one day we can get to a system that looks like this by using uh, Will's structure and our system. But um, the other thing that we want to do is if you imagine the system has large microscope, uh, you need light sources. So we would also like to be able to let these motors and glider systems um, organize by themselves without any external control. And I'll give the mic back to Tyler for that. All right. Yeah, so, uh, right, so thanks, Mateo. Yeah, so we're going to be thinking about this, this glider system. And one thing I'll just cover quickly is why, why we're 
you know, interested in that sort of autonomy, right? So there's many systems where you can use magnetic fields or microfluidics to really precisely control objects on this micrometer length scale, but indeed you have these really large controllers that are required to manipulate them. And so a solution is to create sort of an autonomous system where, you know, you get rid of these, these controllers. And so we can think about um, sort of uh, simple systems. We can look at some experiments that have recently been done and some theory as well, uh, where they take these algae that are swimming and they hit these friction uh, discontinuities and they scatter at the interface. They change the angle that they move. Uh, people have also done these simulations with these flexocytes, which are basically like crawling cells. And similarly, they see this, this scattering, this reflection that's happening. And people also show things with um, these viscosity uh, gradients. And you can see that uh, these self-propelled particles will move down these uh, viscosity discontinuities. Uh, so the, the challenge here is, so there's this clearly a mechanism for changing the trajectory of these self-propelled objects. The challenge is, is that the underlying physics for modeling them is actually quite complicated. Uh, but something that has a simpler uh, physical modeling is the, are these DNA gliders because they have uh, negligible hydrodynamics and relative, at least to the um, flexocyte, are kind of rigid. So, so they're quite easy to model. Um, and we can also pattern uh, these molecular friction uh, onto the surface, so we can create these discontinuities. So now the question is, is uh, can we develop a nice analytical theory uh, for, for predicting how these trajectories uh, can be manipulated of these gliders? Uh, so let's, let's think about that. Uh, so if we just have, I'm gonna go very quickly through this because there's not enough time to think about the, all the math in detail. Basically we have a constant force on a glider and it moves across a friction discontinuity we can ask um, what happens. Uh, it will see a torque as it moves across this boundary. And we can then ask this question for an, an incident angle uh, theta naught, uh, what will be the output angle theta f? Uh, and we get this equation here uh, where alpha is this function of this ratio of the frictions. And for those of some of you, you might think this actually looks really similar to Snell's law for optics. Um, where instead of these friction values, you have the indices of refraction. Uh, and so we call this actually, yes, we think, uh, we call it Snell's law for gliders, and we can go for a more complicated shape, a rectangle. Uh, and so we can have, so right now we have uh, a width A and L with the length. And uh, we can come up with another equation, and now its dependent is just on the aspect ratio of the uh, length and the width. Uh, which is kind of analogous to the wavelength of light. Uh, so we have a thing that kind of looks analytically like Snell's law. The question is, uh, do we get all those nice behaviors that we expect from Snell's law? Uh, and we can run some nice numerical simulations using uh, Langevin dynamics, and we can put some plots, and I'm not going to go in gross detail, but basically, yes, we see a uh, reflection, and uh, beyond, going along the normal of this interface, we see it actually follows the law of reflection. Uh, and so now if we have rectangular gliders, uh, as we make them thinner and thinner, uh, this effect diminishes, just kind of as you would expect with uh, these differences in the wavelength of light. So you might say, cool, cool story, Tyler. Um, what does this have to do with the material stuff you were talking about before? Uh, so we can think about what Snell's law for uh, optics has been useful for. Um, so it's for making these little widgets, right? So you can make a prism to segregate the uh, wavelengths of light. Uh, you can use lenses to condense and expand beams. And then you can also trap light in these fibers, so like fiber optics, right? And so what we do is, is we combine all these little widgets to create you know, telescopes, microscopes, cameras, all these sorts of devices. So the question is, can we create analogous widgets uh, with these gliders? And so, can we create a glider prism? The answer is, well, at least in theory and simulation, yes, we can. Uh, can we create glider lenses? Uh, so we can start with a ball lens, and so we see that. And we can, in fact, correct uh, these spherical aberrations by creating um, 
uh, gradient uh, lenses, just as done in optics. And uh, we can also create little traps. Uh, so the answer is that, in principle, we should be able to do this and combine all of these widgets to create uh, a variety of devices, such as this uh, glider sorter. Uh, and so with that, uh, we'd like to thank our collaborators for the uh, theory work, uh, Paul, and the funding. Uh, any questions? You have stumped. Yes. So it's a question of precision. I mean, light, the narrower you make your pencil of light, the less well-defined your angles are. And your gliders are pretty small. And all the action is happening just when the glider hits the interface. So how accurate and how robust do you expect this to be? Right, so it, it's going to be indeed a function of um, how straight the trajectory of the glider is going to, like, you know, the thermal fluctuations, how much that's going to affect it. Um, so as we see with uh, the gliding assay, for microtubules at least, um, the trajectories are, the persistence length is actually um, many times the length of the glider itself. Uh, so we do expect that we should be able to experimentally um, see this effect. But indeed, right within some thermal error, and it'll also be a function of, um, we believe, Right, the width as well and number of binding sites uh, that the uh, glider has.